Well, hello again, and welcome to the third video in a three video series designed to uh, explain module number eight in the Antioch New England Introduction to Economics course. As you can see, I'm here at a baseball stadium. What can be more American than baseball? And yet, for 35 years, the Rawlins Company has manufactured every single ba baseball used in professional baseball, and they've manufactured them in Costa Rica. The topic of today's video will be an overview of international trade. We're going to look at the reasons why so many economists support the concept of free trade between societies. Then we're going to look at some of the the difficulties and pitfalls of that free trade and some of those protectionist measures. And then we're going to look at the effect of currency exchange in a global economy. And at the conclusion, we'll try and uh, explain why this entire concept of globalization is important to you in a small business or as an entrepreneur or in trying to understand uh, where your business or a particular business or a particular set of economic transactions fits within the global economy. Let's start by saying globalization is here. It's not going away. It's not something you can wish away. We now have global markets. The advent of the Internet has made that possible. The United States government can prohibit or limit certain substances but we, most of us probably know that any of us can go right on the internet and find that substance anyway and order it from abroad and chances are we're going to receive it in the mail and that's simply the nature of globalization borders are falling um, and that's, uh, that is the wave of the future that has been the wave for the last 30, 40, even 50 years or more as trade barriers have fallen So. First, let's look at some of the reasons why so many economists have, have pushed the notion of free trade. And I want to do this by asking you to think of your own life. Look around you. Look at the clothes you're wearing. Did you make them? Look at the furniture in your house. Did you make them? Look at the computer that you're watching this on. Did you make that computer? Of course not. No one has all the skills to do everything themselves. You do what you do best, and you earn income for that. And then you take those dollars you've earned, and you trade with someone else who is better able to produce or supply computers, cars, clothing, furniture. If you simply take that concept and reproduce it on a massive scale, you're looking at the basis of international trade. Not everyone can do everything equally well. And even if they can, no one has the time to do everything and to do everything well. So that people in their personal lives naturally and normally do what they do best, earn income, and then trade for those things they cannot do as well. And that is international trade. Let's take two nations. Cuba and Spain. Spain can make olive oil very well. Their climate is perfect for growing olive trees and they have the infrastructure in place to harvest the olives and to press them and to make olive oil and ship it around the world. Cuba does not have the climate to grow olive trees. However, Cuba is famous worldwide for making some of the best cigars in the world, for growing tobacco and creating Cuban cigars. It doesn't make sense for Cuba to attempt to use its resources, the resources available to it, the land, labor, and capital, to make cigars and olive oil. Nor does it make sense for Spain to attempt to grow tobacco and compete with Cuba when it comes to cigars. And so both nations do what you and I naturally do in our personal lives. They each do what they do best, and then they trade. Spain makes olive oil, Cuba makes cigars, and the two nations trade. Because when each country does what it does best, it can make more of that product, and when you have more 
of a product, you end up with lower prices for that product overall, which helps the consumer. It enables consumers around the world to purchase more goods and services at lower prices than they ever thought possible. And if you're honest with yourself, isn't this the reason you have bought many um, imported articles of clothing, electronics, or other goods? You realized you could get a good price on it. And going back to our, the very beginning of this course, we established that there is a relationship between price and the quantity demanded of a particular product by consumers. So, based on free trade, you have the result of lower prices for consumers overall. Now, I'm not saying there aren't other problems that accompanying this. However, one of the main reasons for uh, promoting free trade is this notion that it makes more goods available to more consumers at lower prices. When consumers can buy goods at lower prices and have more disposable income left over, it can raise their standard of living by giving them the ability to buy more than they could before, even if their income remained the same. So that is a general, very general overview. Normally I would spend several videos on this explaining why free trade has been uh, promoted so heavily in so many quarters. But as I said, that's not to say that there are not criticisms of free trade. One of the number one criticisms of free trade has always been the loss of jobs. And that's true to an extent, but it's also untrue to an extent. When we engage in free trade, there's no doubt that we lose jobs in certain industries. We, um, we have shipped steel jobs to Mexico and China. Um, there are certain industries that are hurting significantly in the United States because we have outsourced those jobs. And many people say, how can this be good if we're losing jobs? What happens is we lose jobs in very concentrated in industries, in very concentrated geographic locations that have been dependent on those industries. Simply look at Allentown or Bethlehem, Pennsylvania to see the effect of the loss of the steel industry in the United States. It was very concentrated. There were very identifiable jobs lost, very identifiable factories that closed down, um, and very identifiable impacts on those specific communities. So there's no doubt that free trade where each country does what it does best, which we call, by the way, comparable, uh, comparative advantage. When countries do that, they lose jobs where they're not as competitive. On the other hand, there's another side to this. If I had to purchase an American-made tricycle using American-made steel, which is expensive, I might have to spend $125 on that tricycle. By being able to purchase that tricycle made in Mexico for $50 instead, I now have $75 of disposable income to use purchasing other products that I would not otherwise have been able to do. That $75 might be spread across a multitude of industries. I might go to a restaurant that I wouldn't have been able to afford before, or buy flowers from a florist, or uh, buy a new set of dishes for the house. The point is, when I'm able to buy products cheaper from overseas, yes, there's a loss of jobs in that particular industry. However, the additional disposable income I have as a result of that savings can be used to increase purchases and help out other industries. One of the unique aspects of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, was that even as we were implementing NAFTA, as factories were leaving the United States and going to Mexico, we also had the lowest unemployment rate in recorded American history. 
the American unemployment rate fell to 2.9% at a time when our steel industry was leaving the country. And so you lose jobs in concentrated industries, but you increase disposable income among consumers, which helps other industries. And the problem is those particular industries that are helped are not always readily identifiable. And because you've lost jobs in very concentrated industries, you have other so social dislocation that goes along with that, such as the impact on entire communities or entire cities and entire families and neighborhoods when major factories close down. Another criticism of free trade uh, are concerns for environmental and social protections that don't exist in other nations. There is a fear, um, and rightfully so, that if uh, Western industrial factories and other plants move to the underdeveloped world, to China, to certain places in Asia, Africa, South America, that the standards for the environment, the standards for, um, for labor are much more lax, and that, of course, these businesses will be able to produce goods and services more inexpensively, they don't have to worry about what they're doing to the environment. They don't have to worry about what they're paying labor or the fact that labor may be working six or seven days a week um, or have a 12-hour day. So because of our concern for others around the world and, this, um, and, and the social impact, there are also detractors of free trade. Thirdly, there are those who are concerned about our national security. What would happen if we lost the ability to produce our own power um, or to produce, our, um, uh, to produce some um, good or service that is necessary for national security? Do we want to be in the position of having to trade for the things that are important to our security as a nation? This is some of the discussion that has, has, um, that has been raised over dependency on foreign oil. Another reason why um, there are those who criticize free trade is the is issues really of pure politics. There are many people in government, many interest groups, who don't want us doing trade with Iran, who don't want us doing trade with Cuba. And that's been going on for, for multiple generations at this point. But that also shows you the impact of free trade as generally being a positive because when the United States wants to make a friend around the world we generally liberalize or loosen up trade restrictions with them when we want to punish a nation somewhere in the world um, we generally invoke trade barriers um, or embargoes and prevent them from shipping their goods out the reason that's effective is because it does hurt a nation when they're not able to freely trade goods and services. Lastly, an important reason for opposing um, unfettered free trade is the issue of quality control of the goods and services entering the country. A number of years ago, there was an outbreak of mad cow disease in Britain. There has, have, has also um, we have never eradicated hoof and mouth disease in cattle in South America. They simply vaccinate their animals. So because of that, the United States has refused to allow British beef or South American beef to come into the country. There was also recently a situation where sheetrock that was, that was made in China and shipped to the United States um, had an off-gassing problem and a mold problem. And people who installed that sheetrock in their homes, the only way to save their homes was to completely gut it and take out all the sheetrock. So for reasons of quality control, for reasons of loss of jobs in specific industries, national security, basic politics, and concern for environmental and social issues abroad, many people have, who have seen the benefits of free trade and the ability to trade goods and get new goods and get more goods at lower prices also say hey wait a second there is a price tag that comes with this that we're not considering and so as a result of that 
governments will use protectionist measures to try and restrict, reduce, or control the amount of goods and services coming through their borders. So let's turn our attention to these measures, which are called protectionist measures. There are essentially three protectionist measures, the embargo, the tariff, and the quota. An embargo is basically where a nation says that will not be allowed in. Either saying that British beef would not be allowed in, there was an embargo on that product, or by saying there are certain countries um, who we wish to punish and we embargo the importation of Cuban or Iranian goods. That's an extreme measure. Um, it's not the most uh, common one that's used. It is, the w it is the most severe. The two that are most commonly used are the tariff and the quota. A tariff is a tax on imported goods, at least in the United States. Some nations tax exports as well as imports. But in the United States, a tariff is a tax on an imported good. And of course, what that does is it raises the price of that less costly good coming into the United States. And that enables American producers to raise their prices and not have to compete against the cheaper price levels. Tariff manipulates price. It means consumers will pay a higher price for that particular good and they will buy a smaller quantity of that good. So, the consumer ends up paying a little more, the American producer ends up receiving a little more for their product, and a tariff is often seen as a, as a, um, a compromise measure between unfettered free trade and an embargo, on the other hand. However, it should be pointed out that while the tariff has that effect on price and on consumers, it really doesn't have any effect on the issue of um, the social um, impact of where it's being made in the foreign nation. It has, um, it has little impact on some of the other criticisms. The only impact it really would have is possibly on saving the domestic jobs in that industry. A, the third tool that could be used is the quota. If a tariff manipulates the price, the quota manipulates the quantity. In a quota situation, the United States might say, um, we're concerned about orange imports from Brazil, because Brazilian growers can grow oranges and import them. Um, we can import them into the United States, and they can sell them much more cheaply more inexpensively than Florida orange growers. And this is upsetting our Florida orange growers who are basically saying we're going out of business. We're going to sell our orange groves and build tract housing there instead. So a quota occurs when Congress determines that we will continue to allow Brazilian imports but only up to a certain limit. We may have a limit of 30,000 pounds or 30,000 tons of oranges per year coming into the United States from Brazil. The result is a restriction in the overall supply because we're not allowing unfettered supply of the good into the country. That of course will raise the price of that good. For both the foreign producer and the domestic producer over and above the free trade price. It does mean that the foreign producer who gets their goods into the US will actually get a better price for their good than they would if there was simple unfettered free trade. But the domestic producer also gets a higher price. Of course the impact on the consumer, a higher price all around and buying a, uh, a lower quantity. But once again this is a compromise position between full free trade, which would say to Brazil, send all your oranges in, and an embargo, which would say, we're not taking any of your oranges. So, embargoes are unusual, tariffs and quotas, the more likely course of events, 
And there are winners and losers. Whenever we have a tariff or a quota, the consumer will end up paying more than they would under free trade. But the domestic industry also has a better chance of, of surviving, of getting a higher price than they would under free trade. And so here you have tension in an economy between those who say we need to protect consumers and their disposable income versus those who say we need to protect a specific industry. Like it or not, as I said earlier, globalization is a fact. And the, the movement towards free trade has been um, basically nonstop for the last several decades. I mentioned NAFTA. Free trade, uh, a free trade agreement, which is very common in the Western Hemisphere and in Asia, basically says that it basically is a treaty or an agreement whereby nations agree to allow the passage of goods and services over their borders without quotas or tariffs. It usually takes time to implement and doesn't happen overnight. NAFTA is the one we're most, uh, most familiar talking about is Canada, the United States, and Mexico. There is also a Central American free trade agreement between the nations of Central America. There is also a South American free trade association called El Mercado, the market. And Chile has requested admission into NAFTA. As I said, free trade associations are, are all over the Western Hemisphere and very common in Asia as well. In Europe and in Africa, the customs union is a more commonly found arrangement. In a customs union, the nations agree to permit the free movement of goods, services, labor, and capital across borders, just like a free trade association. However, they also agree on developing a common policy towards non-members of the customs union. So, for instance, if we use the instance of Cuba again, the United States is in a free trade agreement. We can choose, the United States can choose to embargo Cuban goods. Mexico, our partner in the free trade agreement, can choose to freely import Cuban goods. We don't tell the other nations within our treaty how they have to deal with non-members of the treaty. In a customs union, however, they do. They develop common policy so that if, um, if, let's say, Spain and Italy and Germany decided that they um, wanted free open trade with Cuba, then if uh, the Netherlands didn't want to, which would be unusual because the Netherlands generally supports free trade, but if the Netherlands didn't want to, they could not enact an embargo against Cuba. They would have to go along with the, with the rest of the group, with the customs union. And from that perspective, customs unions are a little more powerful. They promote free trade among their members, but not necessarily against non-members. Um, and they, they adopt that common policy. Then, over this entire framework of free trade associations and, and customs unions, is the World Trade Organization, which is, think of it as a United Nations for trade issues. It is a treaty between almost every nation in the world. Um, and the World Trade Organization serves as a quasi-judicial body. And when nations get into a trade war, they wonder, why are we being taxed? Why are we being tariffed? Why is a quota being thrown at us? Or a nation says, hey, they're subsidizing their, their product um, and, and they're trying to undercut us in our country. It goes to the World Trade Organization. And the World Trade Organization, almost without exception, comes down on the side of promoting free trade. And in permitting tariffs and quotas and other protectionist measures, only when they find a, a solid reason, such as if a nation is subsidizing their, their farmers very heavily so that a farmer can sell their goods very, very cheaply in another country, the World Trade Organization may permit a tariff or a quota by that country. 
as a general rule, nations and uh, nations around the world have been moving towards free trade. Now, part of the effect of having all of this global free trade and the movement of jobs, um, hither and yon, and outsourcing, is a, a renewed interest in the concept of currency exchange. Once upon a time, um, many nations' currencies were tied to metal, to gold. This began to fall apart after World War II and fell apart just about completely by the 1970s. We are no longer on a gold standard. In essence, a gold standard meant that there was a certain amount of gold in a vault somewhere for every dollar bill in circulation. Think of it as the deed to your house. If you go to sell your house, you don't put the house on your back and, and heft it to the bank, you bring a deed, you bring a piece of paper and you sign it over because that piece of paper represents a specific piece of property. And it used to be that currency, when it was tied to metal, was meant to represent a specific deposit of metal in a bank somewhere, in a vault. This is no longer the case. In fact, a currency is only worth what people think it's worth. It's not much different than any other product on the market or a stock or a bond. It's worth what people believe it's worth. Currencies today, rather than being on a gold standard, float. What that means is the exchange rate between those currencies change based on demand for each other's goods. The overriding principle is this. Demand for another nation's goods is also demand for another nation's currency. I'll say that again. Demand for another nation's goods is also demand for another nation's currency. So let's take the example of uh, France and the United States. Let's make the assumption that for whatever reason, Americans began to fall in love anew with French wine. And we decided um, that tastes changed uh, due, to, um, due to a marketing campaign or to, to some other phenomenon, and Americans just couldn't get enough of French wine. As Americans buy French wine, the farmer in France, when he looks at his bank account because he's received payment, does not want to see dollar bills. He wants to see euros because that's the currency of France. Somewhere, somewhere in the mysterious cyberspace of the banking world, when the American company importing the French wine made payment with a card or with a bank somehow, Somewhere in that banking system, those dollars were converted to, for, to euros, and those euros were deposited in the French farmer's account, or the French winemaker's account. That's why American demand for French wine is also demand for euros, because the banking system has to obtain those euros to pay the French exporter of wine. Now, think of your supply and demand model. When tastes change and demand shifts to the right for a product, you can expect a higher equilibrium quantity of that product at generally a higher equilibrium price. So if Americans all of a sudden want more French wine, it means they're going to purchase more French wine and there will be an upward pressure on the price of French wine. But remember what I said, that demand for the product is also demand for the currency. Demand for euros will shift to the right, just as demand for wine shifted to the right. That will increase the equilibrium quantity of euros required in the banking system, and it will increase the price of euros. That means the value of the euro will rise relative to the U.S. dollar. It will make the euro stronger. Now, 
Once that happens, it is harder for Americans to buy French products. It is harder for American corporations to import parts from France for their goods and services. However, it is easier, it is more cost effective for the French to turn around now and buy American goods because they're relatively cheaper. And that means American companies that export goods to France actually benefit by a dollar that is falling in value. And this is one of the issues of currency that many people don't understand. They assume a dollar, if the value of the dollar falls, that this is a bad thing. Well, it's a bad thing if you're an American trying to buy a European good. But if you're an American company seeking to sell goods to Europe, it works in your favor because their stronger currency enables them, gives them an incentive to purchase more American goods. Now, once they begin purchasing more American goods, what should happen to the value of the U.S. dollar? It should increase the value of the dollar. And so you have a constant back and forth, that's why they're called floating exchange rates, of these currencies. Anyone who has traveled to Canada and wonders why the exchange rate was one thing on the day they went into Canada and something different on the day they went home from Canada understands this concept of a changing, flexible, floating exchange rate. It's meant to keep this, these rates in balance. So, a falling dollar, again, good for U.S. exporters, actually helps them sell abroad. Good for European buyers, or buyers from Japan, or South Africa, or Brazil. Uh, but bad for Americans seeking to buy raw materials or goods from abroad. A rising dollar, a dollar that's getting stronger all the time, well, that's great for Americans seeking to buy goods from around the world. Um, it makes it difficult for people around the world to buy American goods, and therefore it could hurt American exporters. So, there's an overview of, um, of currency exchange. And that all seems to make sense, with one exception. And that is one of our biggest trading partners in the world does not permit their currency to float. So let's talk just briefly, briefly about China. China generally has not allowed their currency to float against the rest of the world's currencies. Instead, they fix their currency. They peg their currency so that I, I believe the number is approximately 6.3 yuan equals one dollar. And they don't permit that to change. So as Americans buy more and more Chinese goods, if the currency floated, that would raise the value of the Chinese currency, and they would in turn purchase more American goods. But because their currency never floats, Americans buy more and more Chinese goods, and the Chinese currency never gets any stronger. So they never have a greater incentive to turn around and then buy American goods. So it becomes a kind of a one-way trade deal. This is one of the biggest problems we have in our relationships with China. Um, and again, one that's not commonly understood by a lot of folk is the fact that they peg their dollar rather than allowing it to float. So this wraps up the last of the three videos in the macroeconomic climate. Uh, and I want you to imagine yourself as a small or a new business trying to start in this macroeconomic climate that we've been looking at. You've got government spending that may work for you or against you, for your competitor or for you. You've got a monetary system that may make it harder or easier for you to obtain credit or get a loan from a local bank. Um, you have uh, issues of unemployment, which may be frictional or structural or cyclical. You have um, issues of price stability and being able or not to count on prices being the same 
uh, so that if you're trying to save money, so you want to invest or expand in a few years, will you, will you be able to still purchase that good? You've got the impact of foreign imports. I've told many small entrepreneurs, your neighborhood is not your market. The world is your market. That's your opportunity. The world is also your competition. And that's a challenge. So even if you um, are looking at escaping from some of the macroeconomic problems that plague our economy, by focusing on locally made, locally produced, keep in mind the reality check that a small location cannot do everything, cannot make everything. Even if you're looking to have a bicycle-friendly community to reduce air pollution from cars, chances are the bicycle was not manufactured in your community. You're going to have to engage in trade with the rest of the world. If you want increased rail, those steel rails are going to come from somewhere, probably not your backyard. So even in, in focusing on local economies, in locally grown food, in locally made goods and services, localities exist in a global economy. They are affected and impacted by global economies, and they're impacted by competition globally. Because your neighbor who would like to buy something from you can just as easily go on the internet and buy the same thing from halfway around the world and have it delivered. It's important to look at the macro picture, the macro environment within which local transactions, small businesses, entrepreneurial efforts take place in order to survive on both a local level and in order to protect oneself against the, the storms that come when there are macroeconomic dislocations. Hopefully, these three videos have given you somewhat of an overview of, um, of the macro environment. will make you more aware when you hear news reports of how it might affect you or an idea that you have. And uh, hopefully it wasn't too overwhelming trying to get all of this into almost three hours worth of videos. Thank you very much.